Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. The reading will be verses 1 through 4. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. I'll be reading the New King James Version. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. Isn't that what they say? You only get one shot. And when you don't do well enough on that one shot, you're done. Most of us are that way. We'll meet somebody, see an individual the first time, and automatically we have sized them up, we have made a judgment call, and whether we admit it or not, our first initial judgment of that person may be correct, but it may be incorrect. And it will influence us the rest of the time that we see that person, that we have any dealings with them. This month, we're preaching on the family. Now, I want you to think, with what I'm about to say, every one of us had our first impression of the family through the eyes of a child. Every one of us started off our first view of family came through the eyes of a child. And the way we were treated in that family as children influences us yet to this day. And the perception of family was founded in that young mind. Now, I can only speak for myself. I had a great childhood. I had a great family. I was surrounded by warmth and love and affection, and I still turned out how I did. <laughs> now, everybody else may not have had the same kind of childhood as me, but all of us started off in the family as a child, and it has influenced us. Today's sermon, we choose to entitle, What About the Children? One, I believe, neglected part of speaking and preaching on the family is from the aspect of the children. And what this sermon is going to be today is to try and show us the type of environment that we owe our children. Now, we'll preach on some other things in regard to the children next week, but today we're going to preach on what about the children. Today's sermon is going to be an acronym. An acronym is pretty easy. Today's acronym is going to be SOAR. Now, I didn't say be SOAR, as in S-O-R-E. That's next week. Today is S-O-A-R. We want our children to SOAR. That's obviously a metaphor, if you're old enough, a metaphor. That is, we want our children to do the best they can. And if we want our children to do and be the best they can do, and the best they can be, we owe them a certain type of environment. S-O-A-R. Here's point number one. Let's get started. We owe our children stability. That's the first point. Stability. Stability means the ability to withstand stress without damage. And in the first place, we owe them stability from the aspect of faithfulness. It ought to be one husband, one wife, that is one mama and one daddy for one lifetime. That's what a child is owed. Now there may be exceptions to that, but the hard, fast, I guess you could say general rule, one mama, one daddy, one lifetime. That is stability. You can go online, choose your search engine of source, and just look at what the world says. Not the church, don't even worry about the Bible for a second, but see what the world says in one mother, one father homes for one lifetime. You go look and see the people who've been paid to research that and see what they come up with. 
and see the conclusions they come up with. And yet sometimes even in the church, we'll not even care. Too scared to preach it. Not here. That's right. And that's what it has to be. I want you to look at me in the book of Proverbs while we consider this aspect. And I'm going to give you another conclusion of mine. The biggest problem we have in our families today is a lack of love. And because we don't love each other right, and because we don't love God first, everything is off from there. Well, let's look in the book of Proverbs, chapter 17. And let's observe here, through a child's eyes, what should a father be to his child? How should that child perceive specifically what the Bible says, their father? Proverbs 17 and verse number 6. Children's children are the crown of old men. Now, that's a good thing. That's a grandparent one way of looking at it. But look at how the verse continues. And the glory. What does the Bible say? And the glory of children are their father. You know, it should be the first hero that you really have in your life is your daddy. Says who? Says the Bible, the glory of children should be their fathers. That cannot be if there is no faithfulness in the family. If there is no fidelity, togetherness, and oneness in the family. What is the greatest problem from Brock Shank's opinion in our families today? It's a lack of love and understanding what love is. Jesus was asked in Matthew 22 verse 36 beginning, what's the greatest? What is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said unto them in verse 37, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Fathers, you've got to love God more. Mothers, you have to love God more. And the second, Jesus continues, is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor. You realize whether you like it or not, your wife is your neighbor. And if you have been buried with Christ in baptism, she is your sister in Christ. Now how do you treat your sisters? How do you treat every other sister in Christ? Do you scream and yell and holler at him? Do you put your, whole, put your fist into the wall, knock holes in the wall at home? over your sisters in the Lord, well then you ought not to do your wife that way. Because you love God first. And you love your neighbor as yourself. At minimum, your wife is your neighbor. If you are both in the Lord, she is your sister. The first thing that children deserve is stability. And that comes from the avenue of faithfulness. Remember 1 Corinthians 13, 13? And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these, Paul says, is charity. Sandwiched between spiritual gifts, he says, these are going to pass away, but love is going to remain. Faith, hope, and charity from that aspect. And the greatest of those is charity. We need to practice scriptural love in our families. But we also owe, from the avenue of stability, we owe our children some firmness. Now, firmness means adherence to purpose. Do you understand most of the time in our families we don't even have a purpose? We don't even have a plan? Here would be today's plan. Make it through today. Let's just survive today. Let's just kind of wander around aimlessly and see what we can do and just survive through today. Men, fathers, parents, from the broad aspect, we need to do more than just survive. We need to have a plan. We need to have purpose. There needs to be some things, for example, set in stone. We need to give them some stability. Help point them in the right direction. You leave a child to himself and see what happens. Same, same thing with an adult. You have an adult ungoverned by the Bible and see what you get. You get a sinner every time. You get someone who's lost. What happens with children? They develop bad habits as children and then grow up to have bad habits. As adults, there has to be some firmness in the family. And even those of us who do have purposes or firmness in our family, here's what it is. 
your child's name Johnny, I'm not talking about you, but little Johnny. We want little Johnny to be a ball player. We're going to take little Johnny every day to practice. Every day Johnny's going to chase that ball around all over the field. Well, there's no problem with that. But I'm going to tell you something. The odds are extremely high. Little Johnny ain't never going to make a dime chasing a ball. You'll spin, 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 and little Johnny will never make a dime chasing that ball. Now, if you want to play ball, play ball. That's fine. But is that your purpose for little Johnny? You want little Johnny to grow up to be a doctor. That's fine. See how much of an expense you occur with that. Now, that's no problem with little Johnny being a doctor. But what about the Bible? What about his soul? What about his spiritual life? Are we going to make him a ball player and let him go to hell? Are we going to make him a doctor and let him bust hell wide open? It can't be. There has to be some firmness. You heard it once, and now you're going to hear it for the million and first time. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith, Romans 1, 16 and 17. Is that the focal point of our families? Is the focal point of our families the firmness that we adhere to, the gospel, the righteousness of God, or is it a ball? Is it a degree? There's nothing wrong with a ball. Don't go out of here and say Brock's anti-sports. I'm not. I'm anti-leaving the Lord behind and pursuing worldly goals. Now you can go out of here and say I said that because that's right. You have to live in this world. It's good to have a job. It's good to have a career. It's good to have fun. But it cannot be at the expense of loving God first. The first thing we've talked about is that children deserve stability. Number two, S, O, we owe our children opportunity. Opportunity means a good chance to progress and to grow. We owe them that. Now, in order to do that, our families must remain flexible, but only so far. There have to be boundaries set. Don't, don't go out of here again and say, Brock said, just do whatever you want. No, there have to be boundaries set. But we have to be flexible with those. We have to give room to wiggle and grow. If you shackle your child down on a leash that's got about that much chain, watch what happens. They'll break that thing. They'll go wild and do whatever they want to do. But on the opposite end, if you give them all the rope in the world, that's not good either. There have to be, they have to be given flexibility. We have to be flexible. We have to give them opportunity, but they have to know you're in bounds. There is, you can go this far, but no farther. I will work with you. We will be flexible in these things. And you know the Lord is the same way. Think of Mark 16, 15. And Jesus there speaking specifically to the eleven. He says unto them, go. Go how? Well, he left it. He was flexible in that. He didn't say go by walking. He didn't say go by crawling. He didn't say you had to run. He didn't say you had to take a boat. He just said simply go. Now, in the same manner with our families, there are some things laid down plainly. Wisdom determines the best way to go about doing things. Think of our scripture reading in Ephesians 6 and verse 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. How do you provoke a child to wrath? There's all kinds of ways. How do you bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? There's all kinds of ways. Do you see that? Everything is not specifically spelled out in minute detail. Wisdom is involved. Now, from that aspect, thinking of that, the children must be given opportunity. We have to remain flexible. What about in Deuteronomy 6, beginning in verse 4? Let me give you some good Old Testament advice here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Now watch. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. 
And thou shalt teach them diligently. Unto whom? Unto thy children. When thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down and when thou risest up. Now, if you do that, you may be, we all may be surprised at how much flexibility we would have, but how much our children would realize, I know I can only go this far. You know, that's what the Word of God does. It places boundaries on you. And when you instill that in your children as they grow older and everyone else in the world runs off and does all kinds of crazy things, yours will say, I can't go that far. I can't do that. I memorized, for example, the first psalm when I was six years old, for example. And I know what it teaches. I know there are governors, there are restrictor plates, for example, in my life that I cannot go without consequence. But in given opportunity, failure to recognize strengths and weaknesses in our children hinders their opportunities. You all know I have three children. Let me tell you, they are three totally different people. They are three totally distinct and different people. I cannot, and I've had to figure this out. You cannot, I cannot treat them all three the same way. They're different. Now, I don't mean that to be wrong. That doesn't mean that we don't have absolute standards. We do. But there are some things, for example, with one, I have to build up. I have to, to kind of pat on the back and say, you can do it. You can do it. There's another one that I have to almost tie down and say, quit it, stop it, calm down, what's wrong with you? And then there's the perfect child that's just like her daddy. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Point being, we have to see each child as an individual. Now, there are some absolute standards again. There are some things that are non-negotiable. But when you deal with people, you have to realize you never get a second chance to make a first impression. You've got to try and do things right from the beginning, especially with your children. Think of what Jesus teaches in Matthew 25, 14 through 30. We recognize that as a parable of the talents. Now, I understand a the talent there is a lump, so it's a sum of money. But did the Lord, for example, give to each one exactly the same? No. He gave to each one what that one could handle. Do you see that? And in the same manner with dealing with children, you cannot push, for example, a two-talent child in the same way you can a five-talent child. You'll, there's how, for example, you quench the spirit of a child. You, 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 beat them to you beat them to death. You put too much on them. But from the, another aspect, if you have a five-talent child and you only give them one talent worth of work, that's wrong too. Their mind is going. They need things to do and they'll find something to do and generally it's wrong doing. So you have to have wisdom involved in that to give them the proper opportunities which helps explain Colossians 3.21 which is parallel with Ephesians 6.4. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger. Don't provoke them to anger. How do you provoke your children to anger? I think one way is to fail to recognize a five-talent child, a two-talent child, and a one-talent child. If you try to expect all your children to be five-talent children, and they're at best two-talent, watch out. You're going to push them too far. You're going to make them children mad. They're going to hate the Lord. They're going to hate the Lord's church, and they're going to hate gospel preaching. The children deserve stability. The children deserve opportunity. And now number three. Children must be taught to recognize the proper authority. S-O-A, authority. Authority means rule. It can be a person or thing to obey. Now, in order to do that, fundamentals must be stressed. All right? Let's use the example, for example, of baseball or football, whatever kind of ball. There are some fundamentals involved with that ball that you must stress. There are certain things that you have to go through the motions and get it just in muscle memory to where you just know. You know those things. Well, what about from the spiritual aspect of things? Am I the one who stresses the fundamentals of the faith to your family? I can tell you. If I'm the only one stressing it, y'all are starving. You don't know anything. 
Because I can do my best, but it takes reinforcement at home. The fundamentals must be stressed. Do you realize that long before they really understand anything of one true God, the one true church, the authority of the Bible, or anything like that, they understand mom and dad? And for example, if dad is a wishy-washy authority, how are they going to look at God? They're going to look at God much the same way. If dad, for example, is an authoritative, lay down the heavy hand, beat them half to death, scream and yell and cuss and holler at them, how are they going to perceive God? I'm telling you, I'm telling you, oftentimes in our families, the first perception of family is the same way we view the church, the same way we view the Bible, the same way, for example, we view all men. Dad is this way, therefore all men are whatever. You fill in the blank. Do you understand? So we have to stress some fundamentals in our action and in our conduct. Think of our scripture reading. Let's turn and look at it in Ephesians 6. Think of these things. These are some fundamental things which must be stressed if our children are going to recognize the proper authority. Listen to what the Bible says. Children, obey. Obey your parents in the Lord. That is, he didn't say obey them in when they tell you to steal something. You don't have to listen to that. Now, don't go out here disrespecting or disobeying your parents, but understand, parents, you have a responsibility to teach them what is right. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. That is, in the thing that the Lord authorizes. Why? For this is right. Now, look at the promise. Honor thy father and mother which is the first commandment with promise. Why? That it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Now that is a New Testament promise. Do you see that? That was drilled in my head when I was little. We'll see how old I live to be, but that was drilled in my head when I was little. But now, have we drilled in verse 4 right? Yet again. And ye fathers... This is a fundamental that has to be stressed to the fathers. We want to stress it to the children, and that's right. Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up. There's what you're not to do, but look at what you are to do. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Those are some fundamental things which must be stressed. Earlier in this book, in Ephesians 4, 4 to 6, there is one body. Do we stress that at home? There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Do we stress that? That's a fundamental fact. The seven ones. And I still get looked at cross-eyed when I say that. Because that's, it's right. We haven't stressed it. Do you see that the Bible speaks authoritatively in ones? What about just in the Bible in general? In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Do we stress this in re helping our children recognize the proper authority? All Scripture, not just some of it. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be. Truly furnished unto all good works. Do we stress that at home? Do we stress the inspiration of the scriptures? How right the Bible is and how much we need to apply it to our lives and families in order to make things right? Well, we've got to stress the fundamentals. But from this aspect too, in giving them and helping them recognize the proper authority, we must feed them the appropriate spiritual food at the appropriate time. Now we understand the authority is the word of God. Be careful. Now, in the same manner that if you have a newborn baby with no teeth, no anything, you give them a 16-ounce ribeye steak, they might gum it now. They might like the meat flavor. But they're not going to be able to digest that. They're not going to be able to handle it. So, for example, when we teach our children the Bible, we need to wean them and bring them along in the same way that you do with Physical food. You don't have a newborn and give them a ribeye. You give them milk in a bottle. 1 Peter 2.2. 2. What about Hebrews 5.12-14 also? 
Sometimes we have teenagers that we still have drinking milk out of bottles, spiritually. And sometimes we have grown adults still sucking on pacifiers, still needing bottles. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them who are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. evil. Hebrews 5, 12 to 14. It's difficult to teach your children spiritual meat when you're on a bottle. Adults, we have to recognize the proper authority. Number one is stability. Number two is opportunity. Number three is authority. And number four, we get, need to give our children responsibility. Yes, that is exactly right. Responsibility means obligation to do something. Why? Because we want our children to soar. We, want, we don't want them, for example, pecking with the chickens. We want them soaring with the eagles if they can do that. Do you see? S-O-A-R. It is not always wrong to force a child into doing that which he sees as difficult. Now let me, let me expound on this a little bit. Do not the laws of this land force you to send your child to some kind of compulsory education? Whether you, whether you send them to public school, whether you send them to private school, or whether you homeschool them, you have to do something or you can lie about it, I suppose. But to be honest and to be, have integrity and be forthright, you are forced to send your child to learn things that are necessary. And that's right. That's okay. But now why is it wrong to force them to memorize Scripture? Well, you're going to make them hate the Lord. You're going to make them hate the... What? Do what? I bet they don't hate counting money when they get it. You teach them how to count money? Oh, man, that, yeah, man, hey. Count that money out. You need to know how to do that. Well, why is it wrong to say, you sit down, and you're going to read this, and you're going to memorize it? Oh, Brock's a bully. No, I'm not. No more so than anyone else... Forcing those children to go to school for how many years? 13, 14 years? 17, eight, however long it is? Till you're about 18 years old and you go when you're about five? Is that wrong? Nobody complains about that. But it's wrong to force them to do things in spiritual matters? No, it's not. We need to eat some meat and realize that. In Proverbs 22, 6, there's a principle there. Train up a child. In the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That does not teach the impossibility of apostasy, but it does teach. As a general rule, you train that child and watch. Watch. It's more than just teach. It's train. Let's look in the book of Proverbs while we're here. Let's look at Proverbs 14.9. Why would it be wrong to have a child memorize this verse? Is it? Why would it be wrong to force them to say, listen, you got to get this. you got to know what 2 plus 2 is. My son brings home pages worth of math work. He's got to get it done. And that's okay. Now what's wrong with saying sit down and memorize Proverbs 14, 9? The Bible says fools make a mock at sin. Do you see who it is that mocks sin? It's the fool. Says who? Says God. But among the righteous, there is favor. Can you imagine imprinting that on a small child? Can you imagine the impact that would do when their friends talk and when they get into teenage years and brag about the things they've done and then remember Proverbs 14, 9 and teach them what the righteousness of God is. Is it wrong to force a child? No. What about Luke 12, 15? Jesus said, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. Is that wrong? 
Is that wrong to have a child memorize that and teach them? Hey, you got to live in this world. It's okay to have things. But when you start coveting more, the greedy desire for more, you'll never fill that up. But we must also, in giving them responsibility, and you're not going to believe this, we must be wise enough to allow them to have fun. You know, you're only a child once, and you may as well have fun. Now, understand that. In giving some responsibility, that's right. But they're children. Let them have fun. But don't let them have fun at the expense of the word, of the gospel. Look at Proverbs 15 and verse 13. And understand this. You can push a child too far. You don't want to do that. You cannot push a child far enough. We have a responsibility to give them responsibility. Proverbs 15, 13. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. But by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. We don't want broken spirited children. Let them have fun. Wisdom is implied in all these things. I don't know your children the way you do. You know them. Look also in Proverbs 17 yet again. Let's look at Proverbs 17, 22. It's all right to smile. It's all right to have fun. It's all right to be a kid. But put boundaries there. We have a responsibility. Proverbs 17, 22. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Don't break the children's spirits and make them hate me. Don't make them hate the Lord. Don't make them hate the church. Don't make them hate the elders or the deacons or even religion in general from that aspect, even though there's only one correct one. What have we talked about today? What about the children? Do you realize you never get a second chance to make a first impression? The impression on your mind of family was placed there while you were a child. Nothing will change that. You have your feelings about family that from the time you were a child. Now, what we have to be wise enough to do is realize if things were bad, if things were wrong, that's not okay. But our family doesn't have to be that way. We can make our families exactly what the Bible says they ought to be. We want our children to soar. Stability, opportunity, authority, and responsibility. Do you have any scriptural goals? Do you have anything? Let me give you some. Hear the truth. Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Believe the truth. John 8, 24. You realize Jesus is more than just a prophet? He's more than just a good man. He's the Son of God. For if you believe not that I am, He's in italics. You shall die in your sins. You realize we have to repent of sin? Acts 17, 30 and 31. Is that a goal? Is that a goal we set for our families? Well, it ought to be. Because we're all going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We need to repent of sin. We must confess the name of Christ, Romans 10, 9 and 10. Confession with the mouth is made unto salvation, but you're not in Christ. At belief, repentance, and confession, you have to be immersed in water. You have to be buried with Christ in the watery grave of baptism. And the reason behind being baptized is important. It has to be for the remission of sins. So that the Lord himself will add you to his church which he purchased with his own blood. Mark 16, 16. Acts 2, 38. Acts 22, 16. There are a host of verses which teach that. But brethren, we have to be thou faithful unto death. Revelation 2, 10. Do you have any goals for your family? I've given you six that are pretty good. You need to start with number one. And you need to go on when the time comes and die at number six. The lesson is yours. What do you choose? As together we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.